everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and I'm shooting a video on mm -hmm. why I think, oh, actually, so the original topic was why I think infrasound is both useful and not audible by my definition. So um, one of my clients and loyal followers, because I, uh, Nikolai, I have to say, you've been so gracious and you have paid uh, money like weekly, I think, uh, towards supporting this, which is really nice of you. So thank you. So thanks for taking the time to dive deep into this topic and explain in detail the many aspects of the research process. It is very interesting. My takeaway, and with my personal experience in my theater, when I play movies at very loud volume that have super low frequencies and very special effects, I do feel a bit anxious. My friend, who I demoed the same scene, felt the same exact feeling. Maybe the fact that my walls and or the room were also making noises and the other speakers adding effects and ambience along with the big screen for visual aspects was adding to everything. It was part of the experience, but nonetheless, it was a nervous, anxious feeling, and we both thought it was awesome. So to me, infrasonics are a must in my theater. So uh, Nikolai Lorimer, who uh, submitted this, thank you very much again for the question. This comes up quite a bit. I think it's a really interesting topic because... Infrasonics, so first off, basically Nikolai is saying, I felt anxious during the movie, and I liked that. So often we think about what is the actual goal in movie reproduction. So when we teach RP, I just did a course, I was teaching a course on RP22 to the Atlanta Home Theater folks. It's a great group. I like them. I, I look forward to working with them more in the future. And their biggest goal is to just get better at their craft. And, and to look at it as an ever uh, improving process. So in other words, never perfect, never doing the best of everybody, always opportunities to improve. And they brought me in to help support that effort, which isn't to say that I'm perfect and I know how to do everything right. But often when you have somebody who has my technical background, I can support a group of uh, experts like that to take it to another level. It's, a, you know, this is classic consulting, right? So um, in that discussion, one thing that I always teach, um, uh, Peter Aylett, who's the one who developed the actual course, makes this a cornerstone of his approach, is to start with the notion of what we're trying to achieve. And that is to suspend disbelief, to transport you outside of the room you're in and into whatever it is, whatever the moment is in whatever it is you're, you're doing. So I don't want to say movie or music, or it could be a video game, like it could be anything. But the point is, you shouldn't feel like you're playing a video game in your theater room or your living room. You shouldn't feel like you're watching a movie in your living room. You shouldn't feel like you're listening to music. You should feel like you've been transported to some sort of an event, whatever event the creators were trying to, to get at. And it makes complete logical sense that, as an example, a war scene would be very anxiety inducing. Similarly, we've talked about, well, how bright should a projector be? Because the reality is, I remember actually, so I think I've said this story before, when Dolby first released Dolby Vision, they, I remember distinctly that to the media, they sent this picture and they took, they were, they did like a little announcement and they, they did a, like a webinar and they were showing us how this worked. And they showed this picture where they actually measured how bright each portion of the scene was and it was the hood of a car or the bumper of a car i forget exactly but it was some front part of a car and there was chrome parts and shiny parts maybe there wasn't chrome there was shiny parts there was glare from the sun basically that's what i remember and the glare from the sun was thousands of nits it may have even been tens of thousands of nits it was extremely bright and then there were other parts of it that were darker including some dark parts in the shadow areas that were you know a handful of nits and so what the point they were making is in real life, if you looked at that shiny car, you, the, the sun would be so bright, the glare of the sun would be so bright, you actually would have to turn your eyes away and it would be uncomfortable to look at. But that's our everyday, right? And our eyes adjust to that. And then you get into dark scenes and our eyes adjust. And with movies, we've actually intentionally limited the dynamic range in such a way that the eyes don't really adjust. They don't need to adjust. We've maintained them in a range that is not uncomfortable to watch. Well, as HDR has progressed, and many of you know, HDR's upper limit is 10,000 nits, potentially. There has been this push towards the idea of what the creative should actually be trying to achieve. If the goal is a suspension of disbelief and to transport you into what it would be like to actually be there, shouldn't a shiny car hood be uncomfortable to look at? Meaning, doesn't the projector or the TV need to be producing 
in a in a dark room thousands of nits. Because remember, you don't want other sources of light lighting up the room. That some people like I think get this goofy idea. They like again, we're trying to transport you out of the room. Why would you want the room to be a part of the equation? So the only sources of light should be your field of view, um, as would be true in the real real world, and that would be uh, the the projected image. So if you've done everything correctly, that projected image is going to fill your field of view roughly, and it's going to be the source of light that's your your eyes are focused on and reacting to. Yes, there's other light. I understand the sun's overhead, everything, but that's what's lighting up what's in front of you too. So. I think the same thing could be true in the base, but I'll add another anecdote. Um, I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying this is this is a reality. I think it makes sense that it should be uncomfortable. I also think that not everybody is going to agree with that or like that. And there's many people who want a much more casual moving movie experience. Similarly, with infrasonics, as I've mentioned before, there is no infrasonic content or even very low frequency content in movies that's there intentionally, according to the creative I've talked to. Now, it is possible that some have made a different choice and did, in fact, implement infrasonics in the monitoring. I've heard some of you comment on that. I will say I've never heard a creative say that. And so I can't, it may have been in an article somewhere, and I, you know, I, I just can't speak to, I don't talk like Michael Bay. He's not my friend. I wish that would be kind of cool, but I don't, I don't know him. And so I can't talk to him and say, did you intend for there to be this? So here's what the, the guys that are in charge of the studios for the creatives have told me. First off, Simti's standard for calibration would typically likely limit bass to 25 Hertz and above there. They would actually implement a high pass filter. The subwoofers that they use, as far as I know, are always sealed. There may be some exceptions, and I know there had been exceptions in the past, but as of today, the new subwoofers that are being put into these studios that I've seen from the various standard brands are all sealed. Meyer Sound is one of the most common and popular that I've seen, and they're, they're I think I said that wrong, I'm sorry, they're ported, they're always ported, and the Meyer Sound ones I've seen are ported. And um, what that means is that you automatically get a lower limit to how deep the bass is going to go. It's going to be basically that port frequency and like a tiny little bit, maybe a quarter of an octave at most below that. But then they're, they're going to typically implement a high pass filter that's going to mean basically if, it, if it's ported around 28 hertz and they put the high pass filter at 25 hertz, that's all you get. They're, they're, it's going to roll off below that so steep that there's going to be nothing else. Because if you put a fourth order high pass, on top of something that's rolling off fourth order, guess what you get? It's not fourth order anymore, it's eighth order. So it's gonna roll off so fast there is no base below that. What they've told me repeatedly is that all that content that people have found that's below 25 hertz, it's not that, like when they say it's not there, they're not saying it literally is not there, it is there. But it's a byproduct of, of accidental decisions. So one of the most common ones is for explosions, they use subharmonic synthesizers and the subharmonic synthesizers don't necessarily have a high pass and they don't necessarily put one in there. They probably should. Um, and in some cases they certainly do, but in many cases they don't because all commercial cinemas have high pass filters and no real bass below 25 Hertz. Uh, for the most part, as I said, all studios are going to have high pass filters and no real bass below 25 Hertz. So I think in their mind, What's the point of adding this into the recording if the system itself is already taking care of it? Now, you could argue that maybe they're leaving it in place so that, so that those who can reproduce it, it's, it, the content is there to do that. But I'm not sure that's true, including, as many of you have noted, with the uh, base EQ for movies that people have gotten into, they did actually start to put high-pass filters into movies because that content wasn't intended to be there. And so what they've argued is that that was not meant, it was never monitored, the creatives never intended for you to hear it, and it was never intended to be a part of the movie. It actually, in their mind, ruins the experience. Um, now, that I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just saying that's what they've told me. And these are the guys who are out there making the movies. These are the guys who are mixing the movies, and that's how they're sharing things. And I'm yet to have anybody who is a sound engineer in Hollywood or any other uh, country's movie industry tell me that's wrong, that they actually do do it. I've heard you guys tell me that's wrong and that they do it intentionally, but I've never heard one of them tell me that. So the other argument to all of this is that 
actually it's not intended to be there. We shouldn't be listening to it. And that anxious feeling is maybe unintentional. And again, not a part of the suspension of disbelief that they're looking for. My system is practically flat to like, it's, it's literally flat to 10 hertz. The response is rising up to 10 hertz. And then around 10 hertz, it flattens out. My minus 3 dB point is around 6.5 hertz in this room. And it's got lots of dynamic range. That is really good infrasonic bass. When I shared that with a friend of mine who works in the industry, um, he's not a sound engineer, although he's got all the education experience that he uh, oversees sound engineers. So he's the one to make sure all the rooms are set up correctly, working properly, and that, that uh, everything measures the way it should. And he's, a, he's an expert, basically, in how you set up and calibrate mixing rooms, dubbing stages, things like that. And his response to me was, one, <laughs> looks like you've put in a ton of dynamic range. Good for you. Two, you're emphasizing the wrong part of the LFE spectrum. And three, this is going to reproduce sounds in ways that are unintended by the creatives. So he, his look at my uh, sound actually was that it was not correct. Um, his argument would be not only should there be a high pass filter um, and no real bass below 20 hertz, let's say, but that in addition to that, um, the response should not be rising towards 20 hertz. It actually should be flat. And then he sent me measurements from actual dubbing stages, two of them, to show me what they looked like. And sure enough, there was nothing really below 25 hertz. Um, and they were they were dead flat to 125 hertz. Um, so a long explanation on this one, but I just think it's interesting to look at both sides of it. I don't know the right answer. I think it's your system. You should do what you enjoy. Obviously, I've made the choice that way. My own system is, as I said, flat to six hertz. And I'm happy with that. It is rumbly and there's a lot of bass and I probably should make a preset that isn't like that just to see what I would think, but I'm happy with it the way it is. And I think you guys should do it the way you like to. So thanks for watching. Thanks for the donations. I really appreciate those. Um, the, all of that money that comes in actually helps to make YouTube worth it for me. Uh, I have a ton of things on my plate. I'm way too busy and it's hard for me sometimes to think about YouTube as a priority, but you guys love it and I appreciate that. And I do like doing the YouTube videos and this money just helps to make it so that I can afford to uh, cover the expenses of editing the videos, even if it's very basic. I mean, that's part of why the, these videos are this way is it keeps costs extremely low and makes it really easy to do them. Um, uh, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, the interactions are great. So keep up the questions and uh, I got more coming. So keep on watching.